Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming out to the Naturalist Night series. As, as most of you know, we uh, put these on every other week down in Carbondale and every week up in uh, Aspen. Uh, and we do it in partnership with um, the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, Roaring Fork Audubon, and then of course the Wilderness Workshop, which is down here. Um, and we're getting near the end of our series, but I wanted to thank folks who uh, you know, keep coming out. We've had, a, I think, a really good uh, set of speakers this year, a, a bunch of um, folks from academia and a bunch of folks uh, kind of working on issues in the field. So it's, it's been a, a good mix. Um, just a couple of things. Our, our next talk is up in Aspen, and it's actually a good follow-up talk to, to this one. It's uh, a graduate student out of uh, Colorado State University talking about the impact of climate change to pikas. Uh, and so if, if you get interested in some of the details of what Ian talks about, come to that one. That's just up in Aspen. And then the final one, uh, which will be in both places, um, is presented by Dee Malone, who's a, a local ecologist, and will be talking about rivers and uh, the American Dipper is kind of an indicator of river health. Um, so that should be good as well. Um, so tonight I'm going to introduce Ian Billick, uh, who's the director of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, which is located uh, just over that way. Uh, not very far if, if you walk it in the summer, but a long ways in the winter uh, in Gothic outside of Crested Butte. Uh, he's been the director there since 2000. Um, and while he says he mostly only does administrative work now, he's a, a scientist by training. He has his uh, doctorate from the University of San Diego. Um, and in addition to his work at uh, the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, Ian uh, tries to make a difference locally. He's on the, uh, the planning commission for Gunnison County and um, also chairs the organization of biological field labs, which is a national organization that helps try and coordinate uh, efforts of, of field labs and, and advocate for their ability to conduct research. Um, so I think that's that's about it, uh, except to say if you're ever over in Gothic, you should uh, drop by the, the biological lab. They've got a bunch of public programs and are always happy to see folks. Thanks, Will. Sure thing. I'd like to thank Will um, for bringing me over. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that I, I chaired the planning commission in past tense. So I've gone on to do other things. So um, it's an activity I did. It was kind of interesting. Um, Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about climate change. Let's see. Um, this is the kind of graph you see a lot in the literature. Um, there are lots of different ways of showing that, that the climate is warming. Um, I'm not gonna spend time on that. Um, what I'm gonna focus on for today's talk is what's happening here regionally. Um, I thought I would start a little bit talking about some of the trends we've seen over the hill, um, both in terms of water and temperature and then talk, what, uh, talk about what that might mean for some of the vegetation communities. And then I'm gonna spend time talking about uh, the biological responses to climate change. So I'm not a climatologist. The Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is not an organization of climatologists. Our expertise is really how biological systems are responding to it. So I'm gonna set up the climate work, but I'm gonna try to spend a lot of my time talking about the biology because that's what we know and that's what I can represent. I'll also make it clear that I am synthesizing research, probably represents hundreds of years of uh, a woman and manpower out in the field, and so I'm not representing this as my own. Um, we have, we host about 100 scientists each summer, um, so I have an opportunity to interact with lots of different people. It's what I call one of the largest annual migrations of field biologists from around the world. Um, and so I'm going to give you lots of things very quickly. And if at the end of the talk you feel like you didn't quite get it all, but you got some really interesting things, that's what I'm going to try to do. So don't feel discouraged. Um, okay, so uh, the setting up the climatology, I'm going to do a little bit of data just to convince you I'm a scientist. If all I show is pretty pictures, sometimes people don't believe that I'm a scientist. Um, so this is data that's collected by Billy Barr. He's a hermit. So Billy came out to take classes at RMBL in the early 70s. He grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, inner city kid, and decided he didn't want to live anywhere else. Um, and so he moved into an old abandoned shack up in Gothic. And he's a wonderful amateur naturalist. He has an undergraduate degree in chemistry, but he's not trained as a scientist. Um, 
PhD or anything like that, um, but he's collected lots of data. There's a big tradition of this over in Europe. People keep track of the storks and lots of other things like that, and he does the same thing over there. So one of the things that he's kept track of is when the snow melts, when bare ground appears. And what this shows is, uh, going back to the mid-70s, um, there's a lot of variability. Um, in the mid-90s, I was doing my PhD. I was in San Diego. My friends said Gothic is melting out, showing up. I stopped over in Paonia, and I was there visiting a friend for four weeks as storm after storm rolled through. And they plowed the road to Gothic on June 9th that year, I think. And so huge variability in terms of when the snow emerges. But overall, what we're seeing is that the snow is melting out earlier. And um, this is going to be something I'm going to come back to at the end because it turns out one of the big things for these high elevation systems is when they emerge from snow. Snow is a dominant driver. Um, what do we expect the world to look like in the future? So what I have on this axis, I have the months. And then I have in blue is when we experience peak uh, runoff in Blue Mesa. If you drive over to Gunnison and you see off on the side that big river, they keep track of when that is. Um, there is a model, and I think I lost on the bottom of the screen the attribution. So th this was work that was done by Joe Barsuli um, for the Nature Conservancy. Um, they've modeled what they expect in the future, which is that black line. The red lines are individual simulations, what we might have each year. They're predicting that peak runoff might accelerate by as much as six weeks over the next 30 years or so. It's a pretty dramatic change in terms of when the winter, when the water is going to run off. And the other thing I'll mention is um, these initial slides are slides I've taken from a report the Nature Conservancy did. They came into the Gunnison Basin and they did a climate adaptation project. So they projected what the weather and climate is expected to look like over the next 30 or 40 years as a basis for helping uh, land managers make decisions about how to manage these lands for the future. So I'm stealing their data for today's talk. Um, <clears throat> this shows sort of the same thing. Um, what we have here are different colors are different months. And as we move from left to right, you're traveling through time. And this is 2100, and we start over 1950. And here in May, what we see is that our expected runoff is declining. The early months, March and April, are actually staying pretty good. But the idea is that as we get warmer, these snows are going to melt earlier. And so they're projecting that that runoff is going to happen earlier in the year. Um, so what we know is a quick summary for hydrology. Um, when the forecasters try to predict the future for water, they don't do a great job of it. And so there's a lot of uncertainty in these projections. Um, they're expecting less snow and more rain. Um, some predictions are projecting a 30% decline in snow um, by 2100. It's not there yet for high elevations like Crested Butte and Aspen. So I've seen studies where they've looked at the impact of climate change on ski resorts, and the Northwest is going to get hammered. Because the Northwest, a lot of the ski resorts are located very close to the snow rain line. Crested Butte is higher up, so that means even as we warm up a little bit, we're less likely to have the rain on snow events. Um, I think a year or two ago, we were getting rain um, in March and maybe even late February. So as things get warmer, we're going to expect a little bit more of those rain on snow events. More of our moisture is likely to come from rain, less of it from snow. Um, they're projecting a decline in spring, summer precipitation, earlier snow melt, obviously. And then the other thing that I emphasize a lot is that a lot of the models project more variability. So more extremes, more droughts, more heavy years. And it's the variability that tend to drive organizations extinct. So ski resorts and ranchers worry about three or four bad years in a row. Um, your ability to persist through something, you can deal with one year that's bad, maybe two years that are bad, but when you have a bunch of bad years that stack up, like we did it, saw in the 30s with the Dust Bowl, that's when things get hammered. And so this projection that we're expecting more variability, what that means is we expect to have more years that are dry and more years that are very wet. Um, that's climate. Those projections are based slowly 
on warming temperatures. One of the big things that's been happening in these high mountain ecosystems is dust on snow. It got a lot of press several years ago. That's the view shed just above Crested Butte. That was a, uh, an event that we had, I think, in April. And if you're a backcountry skier, it sucks, right? Because that snow feels terrible. It's impossible to move through. And it changes what the scientists call the albedo, which is the darkness of the snow. And darker colors absorb heat, light colors reflect it. And so those dust on snow events have a dramatic impact on when the snow melts. And in fact, the scientists believe that the dust on snow events are more likely to accelerate when snow melts than climate change. Um, and remember those models that I was showing earlier on earlier snow melt, that didn't include dust on snow. And uh, if you look at snow profiles, you can see that these actually are multiple events. So these are different dust deposition events that are coming in. Last year, we were fairly lucky because um, we got some dust on snow, but then we had some snow that covered it up. And so that dark snow was not really exposed, and it delayed the snow melt. Um, Temperature, right? So I started with hydrology because I'm a skier and often what people care about in ski resorts is snow. So I thought I would start there. But really when we're talking about climate change, a lot of these things are driven by temperature. What this shows again is as you move from skiers left to skiers right. I gave a talk in Illinois last week <laughs> and I don't think anybody knew what I was talking about when I said skiers left. Um, so as you move from skiers left to skiers right, you're a time traveler, right? And so you're coming up. This is today. So this is real data that was collected in Gunnison County that shows measured temperature. So this is not model data. This is not people projecting the future. This is what you see when you return to a weather station year in, year out. And these are two different weather stations. So both show a gradual increase in warming temperature. So that's data that we actually see. Um, this is another way of representing similar data. Schofield Pass. If people have done the hike over from West Maroon, they've gone through Schofield Park, um, probably Schofield Pass if you drove into Crested Butte. There's a snow tail station up there, which is just a weather station. This shows how temperature has been increasing since the mid 80s. Again, this is measured data. It's not projected data or hypothetical data or theoretical data. This is what the data shows when you look at how temperature has been changing through time. The future, um, again, this is projected data. So this blue line, I should say, is measured data. But this is what they're projecting temperatures to look like in the future. So that's about a two or three degree difference. The modelers out of the National Center for Atmospheric Research, located in Boulder, are projecting about a three degree increase in temperature um, towards the end of the 21st century. So that's projected. That's what we expect things to look like. What does that mean for vegetation? Um, you can do modeling. And again, this is from the Nature Conservancy report. Um, a lot of vegetation has a climate envelope. It does well with a certain amount of, of rain, a certain amount of temperature. And the modelers, the climate modelers, can project what the Gunnison Basin will look like. And if you have information about how the vegetation does in different conditions, you can make predictions about what the vegetation, how it will respond to those changing conditions. And so um, this is one example that the modelers develop that we can expect about 50% of our spruce fir habitat to disappear over the next 100 years. Um, and this, uh, they were doing this project for climate adaptation. This is the Gunnison Basin. I think we're currently, we're probably right there, um, right on the edge of that. Now, not all communities, I gave you sort of the, one of the worst case scenarios, because you always get people to pay attention that way. Um, what this shows is how vulnerable these different communities are. Um, and then there's uncertainty and different levels of uncertainty. And so this other axis shows how certain they are about these projections that they're making. Not surprisingly, these high mountain tundras um, above tree line that are wet, that depend upon moisture, are expected to dry out. And so the modelers are projecting with a high degree of certainty that those tundra areas are not going to do well over the next 100 years. Um, with uh, a fair degree of certainty, they're expecting that the montane sagebrush is going to do OK. Not surprisingly. That's a lower elevation species. As it gets warmer and drier, um, the sage will just move up in Gunnison Basin. 
So anyway, so the modelers, and some of these projections will be right and some will be wrong. That's kind of the nice thing about uh, being a scientist is that there's accountability. We can come back to this report in 25 or 50 years and, and see where we went right, where we went wrong. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to some of the biology. So I've sort of set the stage, right? So the stage is globally um, there's a general consensus within the scientific community that the planet's getting warmer. Locally, there are projections. Um, we've seen historically and in the empirical record that things are getting warmer, that the snow's melting out a little bit earlier. We expect in the future for those trends to continue. Um, some vegetation communities are going to be very vulnerable to those changes. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bore into some of the scientific findings from the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. So RMBL was founded in 1928. How many people have been through Gothic? Sort of show of hands. Almost everybody in the room. Will hasn't been there. We're going to have to get Will out there. Um, so RMBL was founded in 1928. This is John Johnson. He was a faculty member down at Western State College in Gunnison, which is a local college. Um, and he set up uh, RMBL on the remains of Gothic. It's a mining town that was set up about 1880, 1879. Um, and then in 1928, the biologist or the bugologist, as the ranchers like to call us back then, came in and took over the town site. We've been acquiring the buildings and the land um, really for the last 80 plus years. And we use that as a platform for doing research. So our scientists work all over. They go wherever the science takes them. Um, they were much more formal back then. So if I wear even this kind of shirt in RBL in the summer, people are like, what are you doing? You must be raising money. Um, so today, the scientists, you know, the business owners tell me they can, they can tell the scientists from, you know, 100 feet away because uh, they've got torn t-shirts and haven't showered for a couple days. But back then, they were much more formal. Um, and there was a large group from Oklahoma um, in the Midwest that got the field station going. And field stations were just taking off. Um, a field station is essentially like a... a a boat from the British Navy that you stick in one place. So biology in the early 1800s, mid 1800s, it involved people like Charles Darwin going out in the British Navy, shooting anything that moved and sticking it in a barrel and taking it back to the Kew Gardens. Pretty much literally that's what they were doing. We see the emergence of marine biology laboratories in Europe. So there is a well-known marine biology laboratory that gets set up in Naples in the mid uh, 1800s, 1870, and then terrestrial field stations start getting set up in North America in the 1890s. So RMBL, 1890s, yeah, so RMBL appears about 30 years after field stations start to emerge, and the, what's happening in science is they're no longer interested in simply documenting the diversity, right? So the British Navy is just going out there and discovering all these crazy things that have never seen before, but they're interested in understanding how organisms live in their environment. And if you shoot it, it's not really a great way of understanding how it's interacting with things. And so field stations emerge as an opportunity to study, study ecology, study behavior, study birds, plants, and animals. And so RMBL pops up as an independent field station for some very interesting reasons that I won't go into today. Um, and we've been there ever since. And there are about 300 field stations in North America. Almost all of them are affiliated with a college or university. So Jasper Ridge is hosted by Stanford, Kansas Prairies, K-State. Um, so a lot of the universities and colleges have their own field station. For unique reasons, RMBL ended up as a nonprofit. And it's meant that we're not tied to any specific institution. So when you go out there in the summer, you will find scientists from over 100 different institutions, typically 10 to 20 different countries that are working out there. So it really is one of the biggest annual migrations of field biologists. And I, and I say it's, it's kind of one of those biological miracles because we don't know when they're going to plow the road. I have scientists that have done the regression, so they say April 1st, this much snow, you know, they project when it's going to be, but I don't know, right? And I, you know, I've been involved in the county, you know, I know a lot about that county, but I don't know when they're going to plow the road. We have scientists that will show up from northern Europe within hours of the road being plowed. So it's kind of like the butterflies, they just, <laughs> they just know. Um, so this is uh, a view of the town site, a more modern view. Um, we have some of the old buildings. This is the town hall. 
Um, it was actually a saloon, but RMBL's founder was very conservative and he didn't like to promote the idea that there was drinking in the town site, and so it got a name change to the town hall. So we have three of the original buildings. Um, we own all of those buildings. We manage about 45,000 square feet of space. Okay, I'm going to jump into some science. And I'm going to start with kind of some simple findings um, and not surprising findings. Um, one of the things um, that we expect to happen with warmer temperatures is that organisms will move up, right? So if you go down in elevation, it gets warmer, it gets drier. And so if you stay in one spot and it starts getting warmer and drier, then you're mimicking what it's like down at lower elevations. And so the simplest expectation or prediction, and they call it uh, substituting space for time, um, is if you want to predict what it's going to be like 25 years from now, we'll go down 1,000 meters in elevation. Um, and so they're testing the prediction. Graham Pike, who's worked at the Australian Museum on skiers left over there, did some very intensive surveys of bees in the mid-70s. So they spent a lot of time, a couple summers, running around the valleys looking at what bee species were found where. And then he, um, along with David Inouye and James Thompson, David is at the University of Maryland, James is at University of Toronto, repeated those surveys several years ago. And what they found was that the bee species have moved up in elevation. So not too surprising. One example of that uh, expected prediction coming true. And that, if you remember, I showed a graph of things getting warmer, things getting a little bit drier. And so that's the biological response that mirrors that. Another thing, last year, we've, we started getting ticks for the first time. So the students, the higher elevation sites are very nice because you don't get ticks. If you work in the Midwest, I came from Kansas, it kind of sucks because you walk out there in the middle of summer and you come in completely covered with ticks. And I have a lot of friends and biologists who have Lyme disease, which can be very serious. Um, and so one of the nice things about working at Rumble is that it's a relatively benign environment, except for gravity and electricity. But if you survive those two things, um, you're in good shape. But we're starting to get things like ticks move up. Um, mosquitoes. Uh, another resurvey. There was a scientist in the early 70s that did a survey of where the mosquitoes are. And then uh, Courtney Murdoch, shown down at the right, a graduate student from the University of Michigan, redid those surveys and found that the mosquitoes were moving up. Um, each species has a different capacity for moving disease. And one of the things that they found was that the species that hosts the West Nile virus was now up in Crested Butte, whereas historically it had not been found up at that elevation. Um, the work that they can do these days, and this is just sort of a side note, is really amazing. So one of the things that Courtney did as part of her PhD is they would uh, collect mosquitoes which had fed. Um, they would put out CO2 carbon dioxide emitters so the way mosquitoes find you is they follow your carbon dioxide, right? So if you're ever out hiking and you want to get away from the mosquitoes, hold your breath and run, right? <laughs> and so because they're following your carbon dioxide. So they would put out carbon dioxide emitters and they would collect mosquitoes that had fed and they could use genetic techniques to figure out what species the mosquitoes were feeding on and they could also use DNA sequencing to figure out what diseases they were carrying. So I'm always, I'm continually amazed by what the scientists are able to do these days. Um, I suspect that the talk you're going to get, Liesl, is, uh, so I'm referring to her work. Um, so Liesl and Chris Ray um, from the University of Colorado Boulder used RMBL as one of 45 spots where they went back to redo these surveys. So they went to see where pikas had been documented in the past and revisited them. Because what they found in the Great Basin is that pikas are, have started to disappear. Um, and I'm not going to steal Liesl's punchline since she's giving a talk here in a week or two. Um, they are doing relatively better in the Rockies than in the Great Basin. Uh, but they are disappearing in sites that tend to be drier. OK, so that's observational work. And scientists work in lots of different ways. And one of the ways that they work is they simply collect data. They go and they observe things, and they observe how things change through time. Um, they can also take an experimental approach. And this is an experiment that was set up by John Hart, a professor from University of California, Berkeley. And what they did is they've been warming the soil three degrees warmer than the control plots. And obviously, this is not an experiment to see if climate change is happening, because clearly, if you make it warmer, it is happening, which, so it's not a very interesting result. 
but it's an experiment to see how the ecosystem responds to climate change. And one of the things that they found is that um, they see less of the showy wildflowers when you warm things up, and you see an increase in those woody sage species. And so earlier, I showed that graph from the Nature Conservancy that said with a high degree of certainty, we can expect these sage species to do better under warmer temperatures. In part, that's because we know how that plant works. But we also know, because experimentally, we've warmed things up and dried out the soil and seen that sage does better. So that's one of the results. That experiment is now repeated um, in many places around the world. Um, but John was the first to develop that particular design and implement it over there. Um, one of the interesting results that hasn't quite been published yet, this is Christine Lamana, a graduate student from the University of Arizona, working with Brian Inquist. Um, and they do uh, very detailed analyses of how plants um, uh, essentially function at different elevations and different temperature regimes. So they have these white tents, and they can measure photosynthesis. So they can measure the physiology of the plants and how they respond under different conditions. And what they found is that what's going to be critical for how plant communities respond in the future is probably not temperature, but it's soil moisture. So the ability of a plant to, uh, to take in carbon, and carbon is kind of like putting money in the bank, right? So we use money as a capitalist. We talk about economic growth being driven by that. Well, carbon is the money of the plant world, right? So plants take carbon out of the atmosphere, and they translate that into carbohydrates, and they use that to make wildflowers, to make roots. So their ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere is a measure of how well they're doing. And so what they're able to determine, and she's got a LICOR, which is a scientific instrument, that measures the ability of the plants to take carbon, do photosynthesis, what they find is, is that they're very sensitive to soil moisture. And so what's going on with this dust on snow and with changes in hydrology, it's probably the moisture that's going to have the big impact on what our communities look like in the future, more so than the temperature. And remember, I started this off by saying there's a lot of uncertainty in what's actually going to happen with moisture. Um, okay. Um, RMBL is known for its work on pollination. So pollination is its plant sex. So when animals and insects visit plants, they move pollen from one plant to another. It's not quite as fun as, as animal sex, but it's how, animal, how plants get the thing done. Um, there's been a lot of work done at RMBL because we have native bee communities. Um, most pollinator communities in North America are dominated by the honeybee, which is introduced from Asia and Europe. And so scientists that are interested in pollination have come to RMBL because the honeybees don't get up at higher elevations because of frost issues. They just don't survive. And so that's when I referred earlier to Graham Pike when they were able to revisit and do those surveys. It wasn't because Graham in the mid-70s says, oh, climate change is happening and I want to come back here in 35 years, a good excuse to get away from Australia. It's because he was doing fundamental work on pollination biology. He had the data set to be able to return and ask some different questions. So we have a very rich database about what's going on with the pollinators up at Gothic. And one of the things that we're seeing is as the snow melts out earlier, we have the same community of plants, but their flowering times are stretched out. And um, uh, there's a gap now in the middle of the summer where there are many fewer wildflowers. So one of the things that they're concerned about is there's this midsummer gap, and the uh, bumblebees and the pollinators depend upon access to those resources in order to do well. So they're tracking this um, as the summer stretches out. How does the pollinator community respond? Um, one of the other things um, that was just published recently, with warmer temperatures, plants are emerging earlier. Um, oh, I got the slide wrong. Um, plants are emerging earlier relative to insects. Um, so we all use different cues to wake up in the morning, right? If you're married, your spouse may use the smell of coffee while you use the alarm, right? So different cues about how you get up in the morning. It's the same thing with insects and plants, is they're using different cues about when they start their year. Plants tend to respond very quickly to warmer temperatures, and insects are responding in different ways. And so 30 years ago, they 
you would have an insect and a plant that would start at the same time. Now they're starting at different times because we have this different uh, set of climate conditions, moisture and temperature. And it creates a disjunction. Um, and, and there's one, if there's one takeaway that you can think about, uh, it's all in the timing. So, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, but really the way climate change is going to disrupt our local ecosystems is by this earlier snow melt. It's going to change the timing of a lot of things that are going on. And it can do it in very counterintuitive ways. So this is the aspen sunflower. Um, I studied ants for my PhD, and I still do a little bit of work on ants, so I tend to classify the world as things that ants eat, ants, and things that eat ants, right? So we can put, <laughs> so, you know, and then there's a the fourth category of things that don't matter because I don't interact with ants at all. Um, but the aspen sunflowers are involved in a very interesting mutualism with ants. Um, David Anyway from the University of Maryland, I showed a photo of him earlier, um, did some work in the mid-70s on this mutualism, and he started collecting very detailed data on these aspen sunflowers. Same meadow, same time of year, different year, right? So here they are side by side. I think it's maybe the exact same day. What's going on is that our frost events are coming about the same time every year, but the snow's melting out earlier and the plants are getting started earlier. And the flowers are what are sensitive to frost. And you probably noticed that there have been a number of years in which you don't get peaches from Paonia and you don't get cherries. And you drive through Paonia and you hear the big, if you're going through there in April, and you hear the big engines going because they're trying to keep the, the trees warm um, because they've got a frost event going on. Um, so what's happening is, is that the aspen sunflowers are starting to flower earlier because of the earlier snow melt, but the frost events are coming at the same time. And so when, when we get a frost event is it kills all the flowers and you get, you can see there are three or four flowers in a field that historically would be covered with flowers. And in the 30 or 40 years that David has tracked this, uh, I think in the last 10 or 15 years, um, there have only been several years in which um, the plants have actually produced seed. Um, and so it could have fairly dramatic impacts on the ecosystem. Um, David was funded, um, he received funding through the stimulus package um, in 2009 when the Obama administration and Congress passed that stimulus package. Um, this time a long-term data is very valuable because this is not something where you would drive through Gothic on June 26th and look at that meadow and say, oh, there should be aspen sunflowers here, right? I mean, you just don't know to think that this is how the world is. So the kind of long-term data and perspective is very valuable. Um, but uh, uh, people, and I try not to stereotype groups, people were beating up on the stimulus package back then. And so David's project, I think, was named as number 34, 5, or 50th top pork projects in the stimulus package. And so I got to do an interview for the Sean Hannity show, a hostile interview. And, you know, so the question is, well, why does this matter, right? I mean, they're trying to trivialize the research, show that this is really about the Obama administration uh, wasting money. And, and the point that I try to make is it's not about the aspen sunflowers. I mean, for me it is. I mean, for me, those aspen sunflowers define how I come to personally know that ecosystem. And so personally, on a personal basis, it is about the aspen sunflowers. But the reason that the taxpayers put money into it is not because of the aspen sunflowers. It's because it informs how we know the rest of the world. And the same time I was doing that interview for the Sean Hannity show, you had a hard time getting orange juice in the grocery store. The prices were through the roof. And that's because a frost event had gone through Florida and destroyed a lot of the orange crop. Well, we don't have long-term records about what's going on with orange crops. And so what our scientists are doing is it's not that we're focused on a, a ghost town. And I think the idea was, and I could understand why there was confusion about this on Fox. You know, there was the thought, well, this is just a, a pork project in a way of, you know, the senator must have a family member that needs money, you know, who's living in this ghost town selling postcards. Um, you know, and, and we as, as scientists are not communicating the value of what we're doing and why we're doing it and why it's important. But what we're doing is we're using this ecosystem to understand the world, right? And so the metaphor I've been using a lot is this, the Hubble telescope. Rather than pointing out towards other planets, we use RMBL and Gothic as a telescope that's pointed towards our Earth. And we 
collect lots of information and can work out the details of what's going on. So when we see those frost events and we can't buy cherries out of Paonia or we can't, you know, we're paying more for orange juice in the grocery store, we can start to understand why that's happening and make predictions about what the future is going to look like. Um, so this is the study that's getting a lot of press. We, um, it was published in a scientific journal uh, last Thursday. It showed up on the New York Times editorial page on the op-ed piece. There was an op-ed piece on it yesterday. Um, uh, I did a little interview on the Aspen Public Radio today. Um, uh, David Inouye, who is a co-author on this, was on the Diane Ramey. I think he did an interview today. I saw my email traffic. Um, Carol Boggs is a scientist from Stanford University who's worked out at RMBL since the mid-70s. David Inouye is the person who's done the work on the wildflowers. They have over a million observations on wildflowers. So every twice a week, there are students that go out to these plots and they simply record what's there, how many, of, whether they're flowering, whether they're setting seed and all that. And so that's become this enormous database that tells us how things are changing. So when he says that the aspen uh, sunflowers are not setting seed and they're not doing as well, it's based upon a million observations they've collected since the early 1970s. Um, so David and Carol were having dinner one night, speculate they're probably drinking wine, who knows? Um, and Carol does a lot on the physiology of butterflies, and that's the Mormon fritillary. The Mormon fritillary relies heavily upon sugars so they can do isotopic analysis, which allows you, you know, are they using carbon, are they using nitrogen, where is their energy coming from? It turns out with that particular butterfly, they really rely a lot upon sugars and carbon, and they're relying upon the aspen fleabane. And so when the butterflies come out, they'll visit those plants and they collect nectar, even though it doesn't look like they have a lot of nectar, those plants do have nectar. They collect nectar, and they use that nectar to produce eggs and lay eggs. And the aspen fleabane are susceptible to these frost events the same way the aspen sunflowers are. And so what Carol and Ward, they both had these long-term data sets. And when they put two and two together, they realized that a year after a heavy frost event, the butterfly populations crashed. Um, and so they were able to link up. And this is an example. I've been talking about this for probably three or four years and have been waiting for them to publish this. And so finally they got it out last week. Um, but for me, it's a wonderful example of why doing intensive research in a single location is very valuable. Because if David had done his study on the wildflowers in one spot and Carol worked over in a very different spot, we wouldn't start putting these studies together to see how the species are interacting. Um, so the world that we live in is incredibly complex and rich, very subtle. There's a lot going on. And no one scientist is ever going to be able to get their hands around it. And so it's the ability to stitch together, to weave together these different threads of understanding that allows us to build this tapestry um, that does justice to the richness of the world. Um, there are other effects that we're seeing. Um, so this is Billy Barr, the hermit that I was talking about earlier. Um, he kind of looks like a hermit. Um, the American robins are arriving about two weeks earlier than they used to. Um, marmot hibernation, they're emerging over a month earlier than they were back in the early 70s. Um, this is the actual data, again, just to convince you that I'm a scientist. Um, <laughs> starting in 1975, going to 2005, um, Billy, um, when he first started living out there, he literally didn't have anything to do because he moved into an old abandoned cabin, didn't have running water, no electricity. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons he got very tuned into the environment. Um, I've seen him give a talk about Gothic in the winter, and he shows a, a slide of a a fly in the window, and he, he makes some remark that that was good for about three years, three hours of entertainment. Um, so anyway, so it gets a little bit of insight into why he collects this kind of stuff. And so he just, every day, he goes from his cabin to the office, he works as our business manager, and he notes when things first appear. And so this is what it looks like. So 1975, usually around mid-May or so, when the marmots were first starting to appear, um, now, our scientist from UCLA, and Dan Bloomstein was part of this series of last year and came and gave a talk, um, his group is now showing up around mid-April to do their research. It's good for our revenue stream because they pay to stay there, and so now we're generating income earlier, but, um, <laughs> whoops. Um, come on, there, no. 
There we go. Um, and then two years ago, um, uh, they published a study, um, and the marmots became kind of the poster child of climate change. Um, they had started the marmot study in 1961, so I say it's a little bit like the Old Testament. Um, you know, this marmot begat that marmot begat that marmot. So they have this incredible rich database of what's going on with the marmots. And the earlier snowmelts are actually better for the marmots because they're able to feed longer and they're entering into hibernation at higher uh, weights. And so the population numbers have really taken <coughs> off. And this got a lot of press because um, there are a lot of examples of how things have changed, but there are not a lot of examples where we actually understand the mechanisms by which we change. And our ability to make predictions about the future is based upon our understanding of why things are changing, not just recording that they have changed. Um, people that like to fish, it's a mayfly. Um, and what's happening is, is that the water flow, the streams, Again, we were talking about the snowmelt. Um, it turns out that the mayfly um, emergences in laying eggs are very sensitive to both water flow and temperature. And so Bobby Bakarsky, who's one of the world's top stream ecologists, did a series of experiments that she combined with natural observational data, which suggests that we can expect mayfly populations to not do as well in the future because stream flow and temperature are changing in separate ways in a way that makes it difficult for the flies to, to do well. So now what I'm going to do for the last part of the talk, and I want to leave a little bit of time to answer questions, is segue to a theme I've thought a lot about, which is uh, scientific infrastructure and the role that field stations have in scientific infrastructure. Um, uh, and I had a book that came out a year ago, an edited book that I did with Mary Price from the University of Arizona um, on the ecology of place. That's a photo of the Galapagos Islands. Um, sort of the thesis of the book um, was that RMBL, where I have a lot of experience, is incredibly scientifically productive. So Nature, there are two top science journals in the world, Nature and Science, and people will spend careers trying to simply get an article in one of those journals. Um, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of money. You know, we're talking tens of millions of dollars spent to do research that gets that kind of publicity. Um, and it's not just that there's one article that shows up on the cover of Nature from RMBL. Um, this is work that was done in the early 80s on some pollination. Um, uh, this was another article that showed up, a really fascinating story. Our, we, we have an education program and undergraduates come out and the way I capture their attention when I'm doing my little introductory tours, I start talking about sexually transmitted diseases and their eyes are, you know, they're like, oh, oh, I need to pay attention, right? And so what's going on here is this is a, a, a plant, it's a mustard, um, it's a white flowered plant, it's not a yellow flowered plant, there's a fungus that infects the plant and it hijacks the physiology of the plant and it produces those yellow spores which are actually fungal spores and it attracts flies so a completely different set of pollinators visit the flowers um, but the flies come in pick the spores up and move them on so it's a sexually transmitted disease of the plant world so when I do the plant bit they start fading off but um, <laughs> but but my point is is that RMBL is a place that um, there's been very little federal investment in it I mean it's it's kind of shocking almost when I started as director we had a building that we were using for housing. There was a mail order chicken coop that was bought in 1952 for $100. And by 2000, we were probably charging more than $100 for rent. And I can assure you that no money had ever been spent to improve the building. Um, and, and so the question is, is how is this place with very little investment producing all of this really fascinating and important research? Um, and so it, it really made me think a lot about what's going on in science. And, and we think a lot and talk a lot about scientific infrastructure. So there's the Hubble Space Telescope, Woods Hole sends out huge vessels to do deep sea research. Um, we have telescopes up on the top of Hawaii. Those are uh, sequencers, so people are sequencing the human genome. So we tend to think of our scientific infrastructure as bright and shiny and something that's, you know, maybe fits in a box, maybe a large box in the case of the, the ships there, but, you know, it's, it's technology. Um, but each discipline, each scientific discipline has the infrastructure that it needs because of the questions that it's going after. And so field scientists, what they're doing is that they're studying these ecosystems and there's no detail here that you need to pick up other than the fact that it's really confusing, 
right? So that there's a lot going on in these ecosystems. We've got fisheries, we've got recreation, we've got zooplankton, we've got plants, we've got animals. And so if we're going to understand that complex system, it's not going to be a single instrument that we point at the earth. It's going to be a distributed social network of scientists all out looking at that. And so that's what a field station is. It's, it's a way to knit together the social network. And so even though RMBL does not look like a fancy piece of scientific infrastructure, Oops. Um, it is. And that's because the science that we're doing, it's not physics, it's not deep sea research, it's field research and it's about the environment. And that's what the infrastructure is needed in order to answer the questions. And Charles Darwin, um, uh, often as a biologist, um, you go back and read Darwin and, and he figured it out first. There's a quote I'll read for you. It's interesting to contemplate a tangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. And there are two elements that Darwin was talking about. First, that if we're interested in biology and what's happening in the world outside, it's incredibly complex. Two, there are general laws, there are general themes that we can take from one ecosystem to another. And so by studying that complexity, we can use our understanding of that single location to inform how we know other places. And so that's what RMBL is doing, is that these are not telescopes or robots, these are individual scientists, and this is just a subset of the scientists that have worked out at RMBL. And they're all doing different things, but by doing them in a single location, we're able to weave together those different research methodologies. So just as Carol and David were able to take, um, they have each worked for 30 or 40 years on plants, and the other one's worked on, on butterflies, and they can stitch that together, that happens over and over again out in Gothic. Um, one of the things I like to emphasize, because a lot of times people think, well, it's, it's kind of a, an excuse for scientists to go to beautiful locations. That's true, but <laughs> it's not only that that's what they're doing, but the science really does matter. And it's really important for me to emphasize this because almost everything that the scientists do up there is subsidized by taxpayers. Right? So it's not that we're monetizing it and there's some scientific finding that's going to generate a huge revenue stream. Rather, taxpayers are paying for it. And so I always try to link back the science to the value that the general public gets. Approximately one-third of the calories that humans eat come from pollinated plants. Chances are it's the calories that you like. It's the avocados, it's the interesting plants, the fruits and stuff. Much of what we know about that pollination comes from RMBL. Um, another example, this is a set of ponds up above Schofield Pass. So for those of you that have hiked over West Maroon and looked on the other side of the valley, you're probably looking at those ponds. Um, it turns out that John Hart from the University of California, Berkeley, realized that the acidity levels on those ponds were dropping to below five, which is very acidic for those of you that care about numbers like that. Um, you can just take my word for it that that's acidic. And what's happening is, is that the snowpack you know, it gets really big up there, 150, 200 inches, and uh, power plants were putting out emissions that would accumulate in the snowpack, and when the snow would melt, those emissions would flush through the ponds, and the scientists were able to detect that. So when the first Bush administration was in the process of revising the Clean Air Act, at that time, Tim Wirth was a senator from Colorado and on our board, they, and he was helping co-manage the legislation on the Senate side, they used that study to include provisions in the revision of the clean air to protect air in the western U.S. So we can literally say that air in the United, western U.S. is cleaner in part because of research done up at RMBL. Um, the, one of the things that, that is very powerful work that they're doing is they're integrating science across levels of organization. This is Charles Remington uh, from Yale University. He's sort of the father of butterfly biology in North America. Ward Watt is his, uh, one of his students that started working at RMBL in 1962. He's an active scientist at Stanford University. When he started working on these butterflies, they'd only discovered DNA five or six years later. Ward um, studies butterflies. The yellows are sulfurs that you can see down on the bottom skier's right. Um, there's color variation. Some are white and some are yellow. 
Um, they now know the proteins that are responsible, so they can tell you that's the actual protein structure associated with the change in color. They know the exact gene that's responsible for the change and the change in the protein. Um, probably the most amazing slide that I've seen is they are predicting where the butterflies will be found with warmer temperatures. And not only are they predicting where they'll be found with warmer temperatures, they're predicting how the butterflies will evolve and how their ranges will evolve in response to climate change. And so the ability to go from the genes to the proteins to how the butterflies are interacting with the environment is, for me, it's truly amazing what they can do. Um, this just shows an example of how these genealogies at a field station, um, there are a whole bunch of butterfly biologists that have worked out there. And I'm going to skip through some stuff here quickly at the end. Um, so the, the closing points I'm going to make is that uh, in the late 90s, there was an economist that did a study. It was fairly controversial, and it's easy to quibble with the details. Um, but essentially, he showed that if we calculate the economic value of ecosystem services, and ecosystem services are when our wetlands scrub water to make it cleaner, when insects pollinate plants for agricultural systems and they produce nuts that we eat, you can calculate the economic value of that. And that economist, and it was published in the top journal, showed that the ecosystem services are valued almost or more than the global gross national product, right? So there are a lot of things that are good for humans that happen for free because of these ecosystem services. As one of our supporters at RMBL said, you know, why would you care about the science? And he said, well, if you like to breathe air, if you like to drink water, if you like to eat food, you should care. If you don't like those things, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, Here's some of the ecosystem services. So it's pollination services, it's soil formation, it's recreation, um, climate regulation, genetic resources that we use to maintain the diversity of our agricultural crops. And I'm going to make a segue here. Um, this is a study that I stole from the New York Times, one of their blogs, and it showed the investment we put in education and that countries put in education in 1900 and their economic growth 100 years later. And what they found, and this is why we spend, I think, over a trillion dollars. So if you calculate how much we spend on education in the United States, it's on the order of a trillion dollars. It's a lot of money. Well, why do we do that? Because if we don't have technology, if we don't have cars, if we don't have uh, iPads, well, we can maybe do without the iPads, um, if we don't have educated workers who can run the machines, we don't have an economy that works. And so we educate people because that's what drives innovation. And not only does it drive innovation, we need an educated workforce in order to survive in that environment. And countries that do not invest in education do not do well economically. You can quibble about um, whether we should be measuring global happiness or global economic growth, but you know, at the end of the day, education is a good thing. And so I make the same point about investment in understanding the environment. And so if we accept that these ecosystem services are extremely valuable, well, we can look at how much we invest in understanding it. Our investment in environmental biology, the kind of things I've been talking about today, is about $130 million. Um, they estimated that when Tiger Woods, it's no longer as timely, but when Tiger Woods stopped playing golf because of the little incident he had, that, you know, golf lost $300 million. Um, we have a couple board members from, um, from uh, Massachusetts, and there's a baseball player that's made more than $130 million. You know, so when you try to put these investments and understanding in perspective, we're not spending very much. Um, NASA, about a billion dollars of their budget goes for understanding this Earth. Right? So there's about a billion dollars that we invest in satellites looking at us. We spend about 15 billion, you know, and I'm not, you know, some people think that I'm bashing. Well, you know, I have a degree in physics, and so I completely appreciate, you know, the joy of looking at other worlds. But we're spending 15 billion dollars looking at other worlds, and we're spending 100 million dollars in environmental biology through the National Science Foundation, which is a federal agency that funds that. And they, they fund about two-thirds of the research. Um, so anyway, so I'll close. Um, I've given you a bunch of disparate threads. Um, you know, the focus of the talk is really on climate change. And, you know, there's a general understanding that things are getting warmer. When you look at the data that scientists have measured over in Gothic, we see that. We see that, you know, measuring it in several different ways. So we see the same trend measured locally. 
the climatologists working out of NCAR make predictions about what things will look like in the future. We're fairly comfortable, well, no, we're not comfortable. We're uncomfortable with the idea that it's going to get two or three degrees warmer. Um, we can all walk out the door and probably experience that ourselves, um, sort of these warmer temperatures. Um, a lot of what's going to drive things is how moisture is going to change and what's happening with snowmelt. There's a lot of uncertainty in those models. The dust events, which are not related to climate, may be more important than the, the warming temperature in the short term. But it's timing, 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 right? And so um, the metaphor, I didn't get to hear the Aspen Public Radio and what they ran yesterday, but I, I had this metaphor. It's like um, we've got all of these different species and organisms, and they interact with each other. And so think about a conference where people are going to come together like Davos. They're going to come together and they're going to talk. They're going to have these power conversations. We're going to bring in like thousands of them and they schedule it all ahead of time. But then they all show up and, and people set the clocks at different times and everybody's running around trying to find each other at the wrong time, right? So it's, it's a conference where things, the timing is all messed up. And so, um, and it's not just that things are changing because the world has always changed. Right, Heraclitus, one of our earlier Greek philosophers, said that you can never step into the same river twice. So the fact that it's changing is not the issue, but it's how quickly things are changing and the, the pace of change and the fact that organisms don't necessarily have the opportunity to respond to that change. Um, and then the last point that I'll make in terms of climate change, if you have an opportunity to read the New York Times op-ed piece, is I kind of disagree with the logic. Because the logic really says, you know, we need to deal with climate change because of the butterfly. And my point is, we don't need to deal with climate change because of the butterfly. You know, the butterfly will probably be around and, and it'll be fine. We need to deal with it because this is the world that we live in, right? Our agricultural systems are adapted to particular climate regimes. And if we change things too much, then it's going to make it very difficult for our children and grandchildren to manage the agricultural systems and the economies that their quality of life is going to depend upon. Um, and, and, and to close, RMBL, it's just this telescope, and all we're doing, we're not an advocacy organization, and so we're not here, and I'm not here to say this is what we should do. I don't have any uh, great ideas on how we deal with this. All we can do is reflect this is what we're seeing in the world, and we are seeing these biological responses to change, and they're real. Um, with that, I'll close and uh, answer questions. Thanks, Will. Great. So we've probably got about five minutes for questions, and I'll try and give folks the microphone so uh, listeners on grassroots can hear it. Hi. Um, I remember from an intro biology class that there was a, a moth or something that um, it was an evidence of evolution in, in, mm -hmm. Brit in Britain that when the coal industry came along and the, eye, the sky turned cloudy and dark, this moth changed from being mostly a white moth to being mostly a dark moth. Um, and, and so I, I hear this kind of stuff, and I keep wondering about the bees and the insects and the flowers and the timing and all that. And it's like, because they have such short lifespans, um, they can evolve you know, much more quickly than we can, obviously. Are, are you seeing any evidence that their evolution is shifting quickly? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And, and there's huge uncertainty in how things are going to respond. Um, one of the examples that's talked a lot about is the loss of the coral reefs. Um, so with warmer temperatures, the coral are involved in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria, and you get bleaching. Um, and so there's been a lot in the news about the loss of the coral. But I was talking with some coral reef biologists from Hawaii um, last fall, and, and they believe that the bacteria are probably responding. And I'm going to give you a very idiosyncratic perspective on biology. So I, I believe personally that bacteria and microorganisms uh, do an incredible amount that we don't appreciate. I think we have more genetic material in our bodies uh, from bacteria than we do for human DNA. Um, bacteria have a very short uh, generation time, which means that they can re evolve very quickly. So one of the big uncertainties is I think that even for macroorganisms like us, our responses to climate change may be mediated by this evolutionary response by bacteria. Um, that's just a projection, we, you know, we don't really know. There are examples of things responding. And the butterfly I talked about, they will respond on an evolutionary basis and probably do, you know, we'll see changes in genes that will allow them to persist in places that they wouldn't if there wasn't evolutionary response. 
Any other questions? How has uh, <clears throat> what you've studied affected your your own sense of uh, pessimism or or optimism uh, about the future? Uh, so, so my personal take, I've thought a lot about this, and I think it's incredibly important to be optimistic. Um, I think as humans, we've got incredible human capital, right? So if we go back 200 years, you know, our population numbers are much smaller. Well, now there's so many people. There are a lot of geniuses out there. Um, we have incredible capacity to respond. Um, you know, if you think about what happened with Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement or what Mahatma Gandhi did in India, um, while we often get stuck in this pessimistic, oh, is that bill ever going to get through the Senate? You know, we've seen dramatic ability to respond. I think it comes down to individuals be willing to act. Pessimism tends to keep people on the couch. It's like, oh my God, there's nothing I can do. The world's going to be destroyed, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to watch TV. I think it's really important to be optimistic and enjoy each day as they come and to be willing to, to work for change. And so that's, I mean, that's kind of my response. I think the environmental movement has failed um, to the extent that it's gotten people caught. It's used gloom and doom to motivate. You know, Paul Ehrlich is a good friend of mine who's worked at an RMBL since the early 60s, and some people have blamed the lack of progress on climate change because of that pessimistic approach that Paul has taken. And, you know, I'm not going to criticize Paul because he's a brilliant person, but I do think that being optimistic and realizing that we have a lot of ability to change things is important for our future. Maybe we'll just probably take uh, one more question. In the scientific community, do you feel like you've got enough support? Do you feel like the whole endeavor, scientific endeavor, is it, are you optimistic about that? Is there you know, I'm sensing in the political world there's some threatening forces there. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I worry about is I see a lot in the news that suggest uh, many politicians are anti-science, which is completely baffling. I mean, if you go back 30 years ago, there was a bipartisan consensus that our economic growth depended upon investment in innovation and technology, and we invested in the sciences. Um, but, you know, now we have, you know, debates about evolution, climate change, that are very political, um, that really have nothing to do with substance and facts. Um, they're about, can you win the primary in this particular state? Um, and, and so I feel nervous that we as a society are moving away from a fact and reality-based focus on making decisions. And, uh, and RMBL has support from all ends of the political spectrum. And one of the things I emphasize is I think that all of us should agree that when we make decisions as a society, it should be based upon knowledge, facts, and understanding. We may disagree about the best way to use that knowledge, but when we make a decision, we want to have that information. And that one of the best legacies that we can pass on to our kids and grandkids is to give them the knowledge and the power to make the decisions to deal with some of the issues they're going to inherit from us. Um, and so, yeah, I'm pessimistic, but when you frame things the right way, you know, it's hard for people to say, oh, yeah, you know, we don't want information. I mean, there are a few politicians that can pull that off, but I don't think they're going to be able to pull it off for long. Great. Well, thanks okay, so well, thanks, much. everybody. <laughs> There's a, I put material on the back table. We have programs in the summer for informal science, so come on over to Gothic and uh, talk directly with the scientists. It's a lot of fun. It's north of Crestview.